chapter 21, Laura Hildenman's book, Unbroken. Uh, chapter 21 is called Belief. And uh, on the uh, inside page is this uh, actual copy of a uh, note, a written letter um, from uh, uh, Louis Zamperini's family to Louis when he was missing. Behind Torrance High School stood a huddle of trees. On many evenings, the months after her brother went missing, Sylvia Zamperini Flammer, his little sister, would drive to school, turn her car under the trees and park there, then sit in the quiet and the, the dimness alone. As the car cooled over the pavement, tears would stream down Sylvia's cheeks. Sometimes she'd let herself sob, knowing that no one would hear her. After a few minutes, she'd dab away her tears, straighten herself, and start the car again. On the drive home, she'd think of a lie to explain why her post office trip had taken so long. She never let anyone know how frightened she was. In Torrance, the June 4, 1943 telegram announced Louis' disappearance was followed by excruciating silence. Many weeks passed, and the military search yielded no trace of Louis, his crew, or his plane. In town, hope dissolved. When the Zamperinis went out, they saw resignation in their neighbors' faces. Inside the White House on Gramercy Avenue, the mood was different. In the first days after the telegram arrived, Luis Zamperini, Louis' mom, had been seized with the conviction that her son was alive. Her husband and children had felt the same. Days passed, then weeks, spring became summer, and no word came, but the family's conviction remained unshaken. To the family, Louis was among them still, spoken of in the present, as if he was just down the street, expected at any moment. What the Zamperinis were experiencing wasn't denial, it was hope, it was belief. Louis, Anthony, Pete, and Virginia still sensed Louis' presence. They could still feel him. Their distress came not from grief, but from certainty that Louis was out there, in trouble, and they couldn't reach him. Um, being having a twin brother myself, I know the feeling of uh, knowing when your uh, close relative, when your twin in my case, is in trouble. On July 13th, Louise felt a wave of urgency. She penned a letter to Major General Willis Hale, commander of the 7th Air Force. In it, she begged Hale not to give up searching. Louis, she wrote, was alive. Unbeknownst to Louise, on that same day, Louis was captured. Several weeks later, a reply came from Hale's office. The letter said that given the failure of the search to yield any clues, the military had been forced to accept that Louis and the rest of the men on the plane were gone. It was hoped, the letter said, that Louise would accept this also. Louise ripped up the letter. Pete was still in San Diego, tra training Navy recruits. Pete's his older brother. The stress wore on him. Sometimes he drove to Torrance to visit his family, and when he arrived, everyone quietly worried how thin he was. In September, his last letter to Louis, mailed hours before his family was notified of his crash, came back to him, scribbled on the front with the words, Missing at Sea. On the back, there was a stamp, Casualty Status Verified. The photograph of Pete was still sealed in the envelope. Stop it! That same month, Sylvia's husband, Harvey, left for the war. He wouldn't see his wife again for two years. Living alone, Sylvia was racked with anxiety for her brother and her husband, and she had no one to share with. Like Pete, she was barely able to eat. Her body had become a slender, taut line. Yearning to connect with someone, she decided to move back in with her parents. Sylvia held a yard sale to get rid of all of her possessions. She had a clothes washer and dryer, both rationed items that were almost impossible to buy new. One woman wanted to buy them, but Sylvia refused in hopes that she could sell everything in one lot. The woman promptly bought the entire house contents for $1,000 just to get the appliances. Sylvia took what little she had left and drove to Torrance. She found her father just as he had been since the news had come, chin up, smiling bravely, sometimes through tears. Virginia, living at home and building military ships at Western Pipe and Steel, was as distraught as Sylvia. Their mother was the biggest worry. At first, Louise cried often. Then, as the months passed, she hardened down. The weeping rash on her hands, which she had appeared almost the moment she learned of Louise's disappearance, raged. She couldn't wear gloves and could no longer do anything with her hands. Sylvia and her father took over the cooking. Sylvia quit her job in a dentist's office and took on a new one as a dental assistant in an army hospital. 
hoping that the job might give her access to information about Louie. Then, she heard talk of a plane shortage in the military, so she took a second job moonlighting on the evening shift in the blueprint office of an aircraft factory. She was almost unbearably tense. One evening, leaving work late, she came upon a group of workers sitting under a plane gambling. She suddenly found herself shouting at them, saying that her brother was missing. America needed planes, and here they were, goofing off. Sylvie was startled by her outburst, but she didn't regret it. It made her feel better. On October 6th, Louis' armor's army trunk, trunk bumped onto her parents' doorstep, heavy and final. Louise couldn't bring herself to look inside. She had it dragged to the basement and covered it with a blanket. It would sit there, unopened, for the rest of her life. Everyone in the family was suffering, but the children wanted to insulate their mother. They never cried together, instead telling each other invented stories of Louis' adventure on a tropical island. Most of the time, Anthony simply couldn't talk about Louis. Sylvia spent a lot of time in church, praying for Louis and Harvey. Sometimes she and Virginia drove to San Diego to see Pete, and they'd all go out for a drink to cheer one another up. They never discussed the possibility that Louis was dead. When Sylvia walked through downtown Torrance with her family, she noticed a blink oblique glances from passerbys. Their expressions seemed to say that they pitied the Zamperinis for being unable to accept the truth. They never gave up hope, the Zamperinis, and they had reason not to. Every evening, Sylvia wrote a letter to her husband. Every week or so, she wrote one to Louis. She made a point of writing as if everything were normal, sharing the trivial news of home. She added an address for Harvey. For Louis, she had nothing, so she addressed the letters to the Red Cross. she tell her mother that she was mailing letters, get in the car, drive to the post office, and drop the letters in the box. Then she'd drive to Torrance High, park under the trees, and cry. At night, when the lights were out and she was alone in her childhood bed, Sylvia often broke down again. When sleep came, it was fitful and haunted. Because she knew nothing what had happened to her brother, her mind latched onto the image she had seen in the newspaper after Nauru, Louis peering through a hole in the side of Superman. The image had fixed in her mind the idea of Louis being shot, and this was the point around which her nightmare circled. Never a crash, never water, only bullets bloodying Louis as he sat in his plane. Sylvia was always trying to get to Louis, but she was never able. As bad as the nightmares were, in them, Louis was never killed. Even Sylvia's imagination didn't allow for her brother's death. In December 1943, the family prepared to celebrate their first Christmas without Louis. The mailman knocked at the door each day to deliver a harvest of cards and letters, most of them offering sympathy. The holiday tree was strung with popcorn and cranberries, and beneath it sat a collection of gifts for Louis. The gifts would be tucked away in the belief that one day, Louis would come home to open them himself. Louis brought a little Christmas card depicting a cherub, a cherub in a red dress blowing a horn as she stood surrounded by lambs. Inside, she wrote a message. Dear Louis, Dear Louis, Dear Louis, wherever you are, I know you want us to think you are well and safe. May God be with you and guide you. Love from all, Mother, Dad, Pete, Sylvia, and Virginia. Two months later, after a campaign of saturation bombing, America seized Kawajala. That was the island that Louis and uh, uh, his friend used to be on. The island's dense jungle had been bombed away. In its place were massive craters, burned tree stumps, and churned earth. The entire island looked as if it had been picked up 20,000 feet and then dropped, said one serviceman. In what was left of an administrative building, someone found a stack of documents. Outside, a serviceman, climbing through the remains of a wooden structure, saw something in the wreckage and dug it out. It was a long splinter of wood, etched along the slat, in capital letters was the name, Louise Zamperini. On Oahu, John D.C. was summoned to Hickam Field, where he arrived. He was handed translations of some of the Japanese documents that had been taken from the island. He began to read, Two American airmen, the document said had been fished from a life raft and brought to, to Kwajilin, the island that they were on. Their names weren't given, but they were described as a pilot and a bombarder. They'd been in a plane crash. The date was apparently provided, and three men had survived, but one had died on the raft. The other two had drifted for 47 days. Included among the papers were interrogation reports and drawings of B-24s made by the captives. The report stated that the men had been beaten, then sent to Japan by boat. Wow. So that they know that they're alive now. The mil American military is like, whoa, they survived the crash. The moment, because Zamperini, Zamp, Louis left a note that, that he hid in his POW room. The moment that DZ read the report, he knew who the men were. DZ had been long at war and the experience had grown, ground away his emotions. 
but this revelation broke through. Phillips and Zamperini had survived their crash. DC's elation was tailed by a sinking sense of guilt. In their painstaking search of the ocean, they had missed seeing the lost men, but the enemy had not. I was happy to have found them, DC recalled, but the next thing is, where the hell are they? If the report of their transport in Japan was correct, it still didn't mean that they had gotten there alive or they had survived whatever lay in store for them. The military now knew with a fair amount of certainty that everyone who had gone up in the Green Hornet, with the exception of Zamperini and Phillips, was dead. Apparently because of the sketchiness of the reports and the fact that Louise and Phil's, Louise and Phil's fates were still unknown, the families of the dead and the two still missing weren't notified. Like the Zamperinis, the Phillips had been largely in the dark since Alan had disappeared. Alan's father was at Camp Pickett in Virginia. His mother, Kelsey, rattled around in her empty house in Princeton, Indiana. After the telegram informing them that Alan was missing, they received a letter from an Justin from the 42nd Squadron giving details on how Alan disappeared. The adjunct wrote with a tone of finality, speaking of your hour of grief, noting that Alan will always be revered by the members of this organization and offering to extend myself to you to ease your sorrow. The next month, a package came to Alan's father at Camp Pickett. In it were two bronze oak leaf clusters awarded to Alan for his valor in the missions of Mackin, Tara, and Nauru. Pending final determination of your son's status, the cover letter read, the oak leaf clusters are being sent to you for safekeeping. Though the Phillips didn't know it, the medals arrived the same week Alan was captured. Chaplain Phillips wanted to send the oak leaf clusters to his wife, but feared losing them in the mail, so he kept them with him in Virginia. He took a picture of them, along with Alan's service ribbons, wings, insignia, and air medal, attached the picture to a maroon piece of felt that he'd cut from a lady's hat, and glued the felt to a walnut plaque. When he got back to Indiana, he planned to attach the actual medals and ribbons to the felt and stand the plaque at the booth on the bookcase under Alan's picture. It certainly is swell, he wrote to his daughter. In the absence of information, all the Phillips could do was ponder what little they knew. They, like the Zamperinis, refused to conclude that their boy was dead. I think I have thought of every conceivable angle to what Alan did, and I have not dismissed any of them from my mind yet, Chaplain Phillips wrote to his daughter in August. So many things could be true about it all that they built up me a feeling of confidence that will not be shaken. Someday we are all going to have that reunion we are hoping and waiting for. So uh, his, all, his, his family remained positive, too. For Cece Perry, the news that her fiancé was missing was followed by a letter from her old friend Smitty, one of the pilots who had searched for Green Hornet. In his letter, Smitty told Cece everything that was known about Alan's disappearance and how dedicated the searches were to finding him. He didn't tell her that he had seen what had probably been the provisions box for the lost plane, floating by itself on the ocean. 